It's Joe LaRocca. Surprise! Gotcha. We're here today with Maurice Clodier, VP of Loss Prevention with Ann Inc. and Gary Johnson, VP of Loss Prevention with The Vitamin Shop. Ann Inc. is the parent company of Ann Taylor and Loft, two of the leading women's specialty retail fashion brands in North America. The company operated just over a thousand Ann Taylor, Ann Taylor factory loft and loft outlet stores in 47 states in District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Canada as of February 1st, 2014. Ann Taylor and loft brands are also available in more than 100 countries worldwide online at anntaylor.com and loft. The company expected total net sales for 2014 to reach $2.5 billion. The Vitamin Shop has over 700 stores throughout the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada. With over 1 billion in annual revenue, they're one of the fastest growing national vitamin, mineral, and supplement specialty retailers, VMS, not the video monitoring system, the VMS, in the U.S. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. Guys, look, with the changing technology in the world, every job on the planet now has um, changed the profile of a successful regional LP manager in the specialty store. And what impact does this have, and where, where do you ultimately see it going? Gary? All right. Um, look, the retail industry has is, is really become far more complex in terms of technology, in terms of in-store systems, um, and cons consumer shopping patterns. Um, that said, I think the advancements in retail technology have all been pretty advantageous for the loss prevention professional. And candidly, I'm not sure that it really changes that hiring profile of what you're looking for. Within the specialty world, we've looked for educated business partners um, who can communicate well, who truly understand their company objectives, the value propositions, and really understand the business. So to me, successful loss prevention people continue to be inquisitive, uh, continue to be very well-rounded in the whole business application um, and have the ability to establish relationships with, with stakeholders, be it at the store level or the corporate level. Now, the technology that's changing has changed how they do that work, um, how they respond, how quickly they need to respond. Uh, but in terms of changing the profile of an employee and what you're looking for from a career perspective, it's really been in sync with what I've looked for within the specialty business. Yeah, and I'd agree, Gary. The Probably one of the largest challenges is not staying just within our silo and just within the LP world. Really a well-rounded RLPM should know the other aspects of the business, should know where the sales are trending, should know, you know what initiatives are actually going on within the company and within the store. Because the better rounded as a RLPM, that's how you build your constituency, that's how you get other business partners, you know, actively involved in your program. And, you know, of course I'm going to be partial to our world. I think if you look amongst retail, the best regionals know the holistic business. They, it, it's not just the um, LP piece, the physical plant, physical security. It is understand what business plans are, what payroll is, and so on. So. You know, and I would add to that, technology is really kind of changing the way our brains work. Right. From smartphones to smart cameras and mm -hmm. big data analytics. So you really need professional business people who can really understand that, embrace that, um, and really kind of not become victimized by data overload. Right. Right. And when we look at the profile of that loss prevention person that you're hiring, and you've got them potentially covering more stores and thinking mm -hmm. much bigger about the business, how do you keep them from losing that personal con contact and that personal touch uh, with the stores and keeping the store and district and regional teams drinking the Kool-Aid of the LP juice, if you will. Yeah, it is a, it's a challenge within specialty just based on the average RLPM in, in our environment could have 200 to 250 stores. So, you know, you, you rank it based on what the opportunities are, what, you know, the, which business partners are out there to assist you and so on. But what Gary had mentioned, you know, the use of the technology, the use of not just our exception reporting, but exception reporting within the whole organization, you know, big data. The more data we bring to the table and digest it to determine which of the stores we should be focusing on, but you have to be careful not to lose sight of 
just because a store is a low shortage location or doesn't have a lot of incidents that you don't spend any time with them. Right. So to, to get back to what you were saying, Joe, utilize the technology that's out there, utilize the reporting, and let your uh, business partners know you kind of get what's going on. Right. Well, and I would add to that, I'd kind of go old school a little bit, and that is keep the face-to-face -face communication as much as you can. You know, we kind of become in this fast-paced world, we're texting, we're emailing, we're flipping reports back and forth, we're expecting answers. We've lost sight of how, how important it is to build a relationship through face-to-face -face or telephonic. So my regional LP managers carry about 150 stores apiece. Uh, we don't have a lot of market saturation, so they've got to rely on the phone, uh, especially for those outlying stores, single markets, or those that are not problematic, how to pick up the phone, have a dialogue. Um, and I think it also helps in that relationship building because far too often uh, emails, text messages are misinterpreted, and they sometimes create more conflict than they were intended to do. Yeah. But. You can't fit everything in 148 characters. Right? No, but you can't hide behind email either. That's to right. Gary's point, you know, uh, uh, a response back to a store manager, district manager, even a regional vice president, the tougher questions, we may be inclined to answer in an email versus picking up the phone. I would just recommend in those tougher situations, pick up the phone. Right. It gets us more, you know, additional credibility, you know, make that uh, touch point versus, and we're all guilty of it to a certain extent, right? Don't right. hide behind email, don't hide behind texts, you know, pick up the phone and contact based on the incident. So I think this next question um, might really lend itself to what you've just said about that personal contact. In malls across the country and really, you know, now globally, we're worried about this imminent threat. So I use that term instead of an active shooter. It's that threat in the workplace that can potentially be deadly, disrupt business, disrupt surrounding businesses. Um, and this is something obviously a number of um, countries, governments need to worry and think about all the time. And with the Mall of Columbia incident earlier this year at the Zumi store and mm -hmm. uh, other incidents now throughout the year, I know everybody's thinking about active shooter. How do you loop in your field team? How do you get corporate engaged? Um, how do you broach that discussion in that personal way to make people understand this is something like a fire alarm going off. We need to prepare and train, think about it. How do you approach that? Well, we, we approach it pretty candidly with our folks in terms of it's reality, it's out there. All of our folks watch the news and have worked in retail and understand that, that threat that's out there. So it's, it's part of our daily mantra from a store visit standpoint, during conversations, conference calls. Um, at the Vitamin Shop, we also did a, a pretty interesting uh, exercise with our district managers at a recent uh, district manager field leadership meeting. Uh, unbeknownst to them, they thought they were going to go through another uh, loss prevention uh, lecture of sorts. Uh, we brought in actors and role players, and we actually threw a flash mob into that meeting room. Um, had havoc breaking out, uh, had 40 people take over the conference room. Not in a threatening way, there weren't any uh, fake guns or anything like that, but just that business disruption piece. Um, and then saw how our people reacted to that. Um, and then, obviously, in the post-mortem piece, we really did the key learning and the, the rubber hit the road, so to say, and how to, how to handle that. Because our district managers in the specialty store world, unlike Big Box, should there be a situation in a mall, they won't be there dealing with it. Right. So our role play took it all the way through um, the selected uh, district manager actually being on a phone, talking to a person, walking through that, right. uh, again, not being able to be there. So. Uh, We've kind of just built it into several of our training components, and, and we expanded some time ago from just active shooter to any kind of business disruption. Right. Um, and, and got rave reviews, number one, and as we follow with the stores, it seems like we've actually had some, some traction. Yeah, it, it really is the prep work that you do instead of waiting for an incident you know, to address it and making sure that the field, the regionals are you know, cascading all of that information down so that when we do have an incident, we're not just standing around waiting for something to happen. You know, and utilize all the tools that you, you, you have in your toolbox. If it's in, in specialty, in our environment, not all stores have cameras, but the ones that do, when you do, you know, lock down, make sure you can see the front of the store, make sure that you are using your personal devices to determine what's going on and getting that outside information right. instead of just, you know, kind of honkering down and waiting for something. Know what your options are as it's happening and react to those circumstances. And in, in doing that training, there's you know, two other components for me that come to mind right away. One is obviously the response from law enforcement, 
where it used to traditionally was that stand back and, and pull in the SWAT team, and now it's a more uh, aggressive enter and elim you know, uh, uh, eliminate the threat. Do we see the malls changing? Have the malls, I, I hear, you hear about these active shooter drills or imminent threat drills. Are we seeing progress in the country? Um, is it good? Is it great? Do we have room to go? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I'll defer to Mo since he's got most of the stores in retail okay. or in mall settings and mine are outside. But in talking to our store people, uh, in talking to local law enforcement, you know, certainly Missouri's had some recent situations so we've been plugged into. Um, and there does seem to be that different kind of communicative response at the malls. But Mo, you're closer to yeah, it Yeah, the, the developers have, have, have done a good job with, again, with the awareness. All of them have <clears throat> plans and actual grids and handouts that each of the tenants receive. and and they they do run desktops and that is something you know newer right. whereas before we had the information you cascade the information but but doing the desktops and 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 trying to put it into a, a real life type scenario um is has gotten much better so the the from the mall base perspective right. they're much more engaged you know they've always had a relationship with law enforcement but law enforcement is involved in these drills. The law enforcement in some of the, you know, higher profile malls, if you want to say, mm -hmm. have access into the video that is within the mall. Right. And they definitely have access in those locations within the food court, which is typically where, you know, everyone at some point is going to be or going to gather. So the advancements in the technology, the access to law enforcement, you know, having access to the technology, right. And then just, you know, practice, practice, do the desktops. Well, and I would add to that, some of the feedback we got from our store teams are really around, you know, being grateful to the organization for doing the training and not hiding from it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and knowing what some of those changes in the law enforcement protocols have been. So the, the feedback from an employee relations standpoint has been very positive. Um, and, and you just have to look at some media clips when the consumers of today have some expectations for us as retailers in terms of what we're going to deliver for them. And if you're in a store and they don't respond as a consumer the way you think they should, uh, and through social media, they're very quick to get out there and uh, give the world their opinions on how you didn't do so well. Right. Yes. And hopefully we get the feedback when there's the positive experience that people were made to feel comfortable and they were felt secure in the back room and were allowed use of phones and restrooms and everything else that you get that positive feedback. So it's really an opportunity, I think, for all of us to learn from each other. So uh, one of the final questions I have really focuses on insider threat. And I guess let's make this a broad mm -hmm. one. Um, we have this insider threat. And you could read that any way. You have internal theft. You have um, you know, corporate ethics issues. You might have irregularities that pop up with service providers or other people. And the teams in the field, your loss prevention managers, district regional, and others play an important role. Um, what do you tell them to do? How do you keep them focused on what might be a traditionally corporate problem, right? It's their problem, but keep them focused in providing the information and intelligence. What do you tell them? Well, I'll take that first from kind of an IT perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we do some additional training with the field team when we have our meetings at our corporate office, we bring them in. And in the old days, you know, IT security was kind of their own, dom own domain. Well, those lines are blurring today. Um, as are the lines between you know, my online life and my offline life. So loss prevention folks are really working all the time. They're uh, accessible all the time. So they need to be at a macro level understanding what, what those obligations are and getting that input from the IT team, building those internal relationships. In terms of what to do, their role is really on the front end from an education standpoint, continuing to talk about different internal uh, vulnerabilities, uh, drive that influence that they have with the store folks to comply. Um, and then, of course, having the inside information and, and protocols when an event does happen, that they know what our escalation procedures are. So for us, it starts with, again, partnerships and really just at a high level understanding the, the codependencies between the two. Yeah. And in addition, you know, to the IT threats, as you mentioned, Joe, it could be an over and shortage problem, a deposit loss problem, a, you know, something from the mall bleeds into the store, you know, type of internal, uh, in internal incident. So it really gets back to knowing what the expectation is, understanding what the expectation, kind of bundling everything that we spoke to, which is know what the expectation is, train to it, understand what technology is available. And, you know, just to bring up 
the, the, the topic or the fact again. The more we know of our holistic business, the better prepared we're going to be to respond. So, and, and you know, it, it helps build and expand that constituency internally. And, you know, if it involves a client or an external type of uh, situation, it gets us credibility at the client end. Right. So just use right. the tools. So um, let's expand on that for just a minute. So you have, uh, we've talked about the internal, we've talked about some of the shopping center and development folks. I want to spend just a minute and talk about the business partners and, well, maybe even what traditionally might be considered competitors. And I'll tee it up by saying this. Um, I, I think general consensus is that crime and crisis really have no competitors. So we're all in this together. We're all battling fraud together, and organized retail crime, and crisis or imminent threat that takes place. Um, what sort of communication happens between you and between your competitors and other um, neighbors in the shopping center or mall as something pops up, a major incident. Um, how do you initiate that communication and what do you recommend for people? Um, I'll take that more on, a, on the preventative, on the front end of that equation, um, because in the, in the event of a crisis, in the event of the, the time you need to do some benchmarking and need information, that's really not the best time for a cold call to say, hey, Mr. Mm -hmm. So-and-so, I need some information. So it's really the grassroots effort that starts and so forth. Any loss prevention person, certainly those new in the business, it's about networking. It's about going to NRF Protect and meeting people. Not only meeting people, but doing something with that information, following up and calling folks. So to me, it's on the front end in terms of networking, mm -hmm. building relationships, show that when an incident does happen. I think you and I chatted on the night of the Boston uh, Marathon situation. Right. It's sharing that information, but the network's got to be in place first. Yeah. Great. Mel, what We're do you think? Right. Any comments to elaborate? The, the same. Don't wait for it to happen. And then once it does happen, I mean, all of our phones and our PDA start lighting up. Trade information, not just amongst your LP, you know, constituents or amongst your LP peers, but within your managers, regionals, DMs, keep them abreast as well. Right. And um, so that concludes our time for today. And I just want to make a comment about both Mo and Gary. Everything that you've just heard today, they really practice what they preach. Over the years, the three of us have worked with a number of other retailers closely on sharing information and best practices and the way that retailers are working together. And frankly, they've been a big influence on my career, so thank you for everything you've shared. And um, Gary is the former <laughs> council chair, and both of you as on, on the NRF uh, Advisory Council today, they do a really great job, and I think both can be considered a really valuable resource for people coming up in the industry if you're interested in learning more. And if you have an issue or have something come up, I know both of them are always willing to share information and love to make new contacts and do better in the industry. Mm -hmm.